I ask everybody to do something unusual. Most of our lives, we take a stand based on where we sit. And I want everybody to forget where you work, who you're working for, and everything you think you know about energy. And just assume that we're human beings on this planet, and we're trying to think through what the future should be. Now, it is a fact that the renewable energy revolution is underway. Uh, there's one fact that kind of confirms that. In this year, 2012, 46% uh, of all the new megawatts of power capacity that was brought online were renewable. That's more than natural gas, which was 36%, a whole lot more uh, than uh, coal, which was 15%, and nuclear and oil were kind of minimus. Uh, that's something that's really a startling and almost unbelievable fact until you start thinking about it a little bit. Why in the hell is there 55% uh, brought online by fossil fuels and nuclear? Why is there anything new that's coming online that is not renewable? That's a question to ask. Uh, you know, in addition to the renewable revolution, uh, there's another revolution underway, and it's getting a hell of a lot more press than uh, the renewable crowd, and that is the discovery of fracking and the ability of the oil and gas industry to dramatically increase oil and gas production in this country. And if you read the daily press, uh, you would say that we are having a brown revolution, not a green one. And it's kind of sobering. Uh, you know, uh, we, it, it should really be sobering. And then, in addition to that, we got these nuclear folks that think they're having a renaissance. And we got a whole bunch of the environmental community that have become carbon-only environmentalists and are actually supporting nuclear power, uh, which after 40 years of experience in the field, I can tell you it poses as great and as grave a danger to mankind as climate change does. Uh, we've almost forgotten about the fact there's 104 nuclear reactors over 30 years old that have been piling up highly radioactive waste that after 50 years we still hadn't figured out what to do with it. Now, where I come from, it's almost a moral issue as to whether you should continue to make something that's highly radioactive and going to stay radioactive for thousands of years and you don't know where to put it. And it's piling up. And a lot of it's still in uh, swimming pools of water that if you lose the water, you've got a radioactive fire as bad as a nuclear meltdown. And yet we seem to have gone silent on that issue almost, except for a few of us that are working on it. So uh, we just heard a gentleman tell us that we are in the era of climate. And one of the problems is that a lot of people that I talk to have gone in a nanosecond from not believing that climate is a problem to saying it's too late to do anything about it. Now, just think about that. You know, the, the Nile is not just a river in Egypt. It runs all over the world, and it's permeating the United States of America today. Uh, so we... We have a situation where our major sources of energy, fossil fuels and nuclear power, are what I think an ordinary person that didn't have any knowledge in the field would call poison. Now, when we have uh, lead, a poison in the toys for our kids, we outlaw it. And yet I have not heard anybody in the renewable energy field, the environmental community, anywhere else, get up there in plain English and say we ought to outlaw fossil fuels and nuclear power for the future. The future should be entirely renewable. As long as this crowd keeps asking for crumbs and keeps acting like we are a 10% or a 15% solution, that's all we ever will be. Uh, you know, I go back to where the nuclear advocates 
We're laying out a vision of the future of too cheap to meter. Uh, and, the, and it was going to be all nuclear. Well, it didn't work out that way. I think we have a better answer. But unless we portray ourselves as the entire future, unless we portray ourselves as the answer to both nuclear holocaust uh, and climate disaster, uh, we are not going to get the kind of attention of the American people that we need to make it happen. Uh, you, just think again about the 2012 situation. It is a great sense of accomplishment that 46% of the new megawatts are renewable. Uh, but we have not laid out a vision uh, that you can pick up and read in the New York Times about 100% renewable. Yet, we've had such technological breakthroughs that I never dreamed I'd live long enough to see. We have electric cars that are being advertised by General Motors on television. <laughs> I mean, that's remarkable. And we have solar power that utilities can build in large quantities at $2 a watt. Now, I must say to you, I had, uh, and, and I hope you don't mind because I'm one of you, but I had to almost laugh at the luncheon discussion today. <laughs> he spent the whole lunch talking about a debate between decentralized and central station solar. Give me a break. I have lived for 40 years and I've never seen the coal industry have a discussion between strip mining and underground mining or the nuclear industry having a debate between light water reactors and boiling water reactors or the gas industry having a debate between fracking or just drilling. Uh, you know, we don't have time for such foolishness. We need 100 times as much as we're doing of both. Uh, you know, we, we have a special responsibility because we do know that the renewable technology is here and now and is not a distant dream and is not a 10% solution. With the electric car, we now have a motor that's 99% efficient compared to an internal combustion engine and we can run cars with the energy efficiency of a dollar ga a gallon gasoline, which kind of suggests that maybe electricity is way underpriced and that if it was just 10 or 15% higher, there wouldn't be any debate about whether solar was economic or not. Uh, we're not bringing to the attention of the American people that the price of oil goes up and up because some character in I Iran uh, makes a speech or the OPEC cartel gets together, and yet we get all excited if the regulatory commission is going to give electricity a 5% rate increase. We've got to educate the people that solar and wind-powered electricity is the cheapest energy on earth if you measure the cost of society. Uh, and we ought to be laying out a 100% renewable program over a reasonable number of years. But the most important thing is that we make progress each year. And let me tell you something. I don't think anybody in this room has, has cut a deal with Mother Nature to say that we got X number of years that we can wait. Uh, the waiting time is over. Uh, there needs to be a sense of urgency about these issues that go beyond the interests of any individual solar company or any individual person or any one person's career. And who gives a damn whether Austin Electric survives or not? I mean, the purpose is to do, provide service to the, to the customer in a manner that will preserve the high energy civilization. And if everybody in the city wants to have decentral uh, solar power and get off the grid, and that gives us a 100% renewable energy supply, so be it. I mean, it's time that we began to realize that it's not about me, and it's not about you, it's not about my company or someone else's company. It's about the survival of this high energy civilization on this earth, and we need to be using what knowledge we have of the subject matter to get that message across to others. Now, I am very proud of being a 20th century American, and I'm still an American in the 21st century. Uh, but let's face the fact that this country is not what it was in the 40s and 50s. The last president that asked us to do anything for our country was Jack Kennedy. You can take the candidates from either party on any election, and they could each 
All of them have the same billboard. And I can tell you what it says. I'm on your side. That's all they tell you. They all tell you what they think you want to hear. Uh, but it's time that we faced up to the fact that this problem can't live off of its press clippings from World War II. Uh, that we've got to start doing something, doing something real. We need to lay out a vision for the world of an all-renewable energy supply and lay it out over a 20 or 30 year period, but start doing something each year. It's easy to make the speeches and set the goals down the road, and then years go by and nothing happened, and the carbon keeps going up there, and the nuclear plants keep getting older, and you know, all right, so we lost a little bit of Japan last year. Okay, forget about that, that's over there. <laughs> you know, uh, we've got nuclear plants sitting next to earthquake faults in California and elsewhere in this country. Uh, we need to let the world know that we're, this civilization of ours is on death row and it can get off of there only by collective action. I don't think that the, the uh, governments at the federal, state, or local level are doing any more than kind of reacting uh, to the values of their citizens and not showing any leadership. I still believe there's a good angel in every American, in every European, and every Asian that needs to be appealed to. Uh, but some, somewhere in this environmental community and renewable energy community of ours, we need to be appealing to the good angel that is still in people and not to their more selfish, more self-oriented uh, way of living, which I indulge in and which most of the people in this room indulge in. Uh, but the sense of community that we once had uh, during and right after World War II and the feeling that we could do something collectively through our government, such as building a highway system, such as going to the moon and doing things. There are some things that, that we can, can only do as a community. And I think one of them is laying out this vision for an all renewable energy supply with the technology that we have. And believe me, the more it's deployed, the more it's gonna be improved because that's when the cash flow flows. Now I have, two specific suggestions that I want you to consider that will help accelerate uh, the revolution. I don't think you can pass a carbon tax big enough to make a difference. I mean, look, the price of gasoline went from $2 to three, three and a half, and it's cut down use a little bit, but it's not really solving the problem. If something is poison, it needs to be outlawed. And I would suggest that we get behind a federal statute that says that carbon must be reduced 3% a year each year. And to the extent that a utility or whoever the major consumer is does not meet the 3% goal, that there be a very, very heavy uh, tax fee, whatever you want to call it, that can't be passed on to the consumer, that has to be absorbed by the shareholder. Now that will be enforced. The IRS knows how to enforce the law. Nobody else really does. <laughs> and if we could get a law passed that, were, that put us on that march of 3% a year and also uh, a law that says that when the nuclear power plant reaches 40 years old, the NRC doesn't give it a 20 year extension like it was a Valentine, that it comes to a useful end of its 40 year life. If we can phase out a nuclear that way and, and phase out of coal, oh, that every coal power plant when it reaches 40 years old is retired uh, and, and move toward an all renewable future, then we will have a chance of avoiding the worst of climate. We're still gonna get a lot and the worst of nuclear power. And we'll have an energy system that truly will be sustainable but we need to lay out that vision and we need to do that in an unmistakable manner. You know, marketing has always been the weak spot of the renewable in industry because we are so uh, enamored with our technology and what it's done. Uh, but somehow or another, we have to realize that we're in a fight between the green revolution and the brown revolution. I think it's gonna take everybody in this room and everybody you know 
to start thinking through how we can reach out. Uh, and for every meeting of this kind, we ought to have 100 meetings where people are inviting at least 10 of their friends in for a coffee and laying this thing out and trying to put enough money together to lay it out uh, the way uh, Boone Pickens tried to lay out his gas plan. Uh, you know, I have nothing against natural gas except that it's poison. <laughs> Plain and simple. When we wanted to uh, cure people of getting lung cancer, we didn't tell them to stop smoking camels and start smoking light cigarettes. We said stop smoking. Uh, and uh, natural gas is, is going to be useful as a transition. Uh, but we ought to stop, and I know this is sacrilegious in Texas, but we ought to stop drilling for more gas and oil altogether and recognize that what we have is enough to get us through the transition. The only way you're going to get a 100% renewable future is you start building renewable energy for all of our future needs and stop making more poison. I implore you to start speaking to the American people and your fellow citizens in plain, stark English, and then put some strength behind this revolution and get a sense of urgency that we really need to have because, frankly, this high energy civilization of ours is looking for leadership. And I can tell you that if Texas does it, it speaks with a thousand times more strength than if California does it. So the, the, the burden of, is on you guys uh, to fan the flame of this revolution and make it happen. Thank you. Thank you.